finish up information criteria. All we have left is ensembles, and then we're going to spend the rest of the week, most of the day, and all of Thursday talking about interaction effects, uh, which will be relaxation and, uh, to some extent, but we're going to keep applying everything we've learned before. So you, you did some steep gradient ascent in hill climbing last week, learning information theory and everything else, right? And you're mastering that in your homework now, and you'll have a chance to rest a little bit uh, this week before we start uh, another steep pitch uh, in, a, in a few weeks. Um, so let's do ensembles. Uh, where I just got to the point where I wanted to say that uh, I, I'm encouraging people to still get these jokes. Uh, <laughs> fine, that's, it's encouraging. Um, that uh, it's very often to see people use model selection because they're hunting for the true model. Uh, in the set. And I, I want to say that this makes no sense. It really does uh, make no sense at all because none of the models you are fitting to the data are the true data generating models for any of the things people in this room study. Uh, I, I will agree, which means social scientists and biologists. So I'm sorry, none of the statistical models you're writing down, especially linear regressions, are the actual data generating models of the phenomena you study. That doesn't mean they're not useful. Uh, it just means that if you're hunting for the true model in the set of models you fit to your data, you need to turn around and look the other direction, right? <laughs> and uh, towards theory, not towards your statistical models. Uh, nevertheless, these, these sets of models can be very useful. So uh, you'll see this a lot. Um, uh, biologists in particular like to use whichever information criterion that they prefer to, to try to identify the true model in the set. And, uh, this really isn't what information criteria are designed to do. So think back to last week, where I was spent forever in the dark road, right, on our way to the beach. Um, all that was about finding a model that makes good out of sample predictions, given the training set you have, given the constraints on information that are present and the structure of the model. Uh, and that, and information criteria I showed you in those simulations do exactly that. They do a good job, assuming all their assumptions are met, of finding a model that will have the best expected out of sample deviance. But that doesn't mean it's the true model. Uh, and I kept saying that information criteria may select a simpler model than is quote unquote correct, because you can't estimate all the parameters in the structurally correct <laughs> model. Um, and it can also, now I want to say, select models that are more complicated than the true model. Uh, however, this is not bad because in both of those cases, it's picking the model that makes the best expected out of sample prediction. So you're saying, okay, how can a more overly complex model make the best out of sample predictions? Because as your sample size goes up, the parameter estimates for the terms that are pretender terms converge to zero. Uh, and so there's no foul. Uh, and AIC or any of the other ICs will say, yeah, this overly complex model is the best one. I know, yeah, by the way, it has a bunch of beta coefficients that are almost exactly zero and have no impact on prediction. So it doesn't do any harm. Now, this is important because you'll sometimes read that information criteria are inconsistent for model identification, which is correct because that's not what they're designed to do. Inconsistent in statistics means doesn't, as, it, as the sample size goes to infinity, it doesn't do that same. Uh, so inconsistent for model identification is as your sample size goes to infinity, AIC, DIC, WIC don't pick the data generating model. Uh, but they will pick perfect predictions. So there's no harm in that. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's what I'm trying to say here. Uh, and as a consequence of this, what you want to do is, you, as always, focus on prediction. None of these models that you're fitting to data are the true biological or social data generating processes, <laughs> but they can be useful descriptions of it. Every model you fit, uh, is, even if it's structurally correct, will overfit to the sample to some extent. <coughs> Uh, so we focus on predictions, and we need some way to use all the models in the set to construct predictions. And this is where we turn to the next uh, useful procedural skill, which is constructing prediction ensembles. Um, often this is called a, a model averaging. There's a big literature on this, and there are lots of different ways of constructing model averages. We're going to proceed with the information theoretic way of doing it by using the Akaike weights of the models that we construct using the differences and deviances, because those are relative distances, uh, relative differences in distance uh, uh, from the target. That is, their, their proportional differences in, in KL divergence for each model. So um, here's, here's the way you think about it. When we compute predictions for a single model, 
Uh, I've tried to make you compulsive about using the full posterior, right? Uh, plucking out just the map is a formula for overconfidence, right? And so use the full posterior every time. Likewise, when you fit more than one model, it'd be good to use the predictions of all the models and average over them. So we can do that as well. Um, and uh, this guards against overconfidence in model structure. And it allows us to construct predictions that are less overfit than the predictions of any single model in the set. OK, so think about this as, as the ensemble problem. Here's the procedure. First, you compute the information weight for each model. So you've got your sample. You fit a series of models to the same data. Right? And from this, you can compute their, uh, your, your information criterion of choice. I'm going to have you guys use WAIC, as you are in your homework. From that, you can compute the, the aka ek weight or information weight for each model. And those are all those always sum to one. So they give you the proportion of the prediction ensemble you want to come from each particular model. Um, and uh, then you compute the distribution of predictions for each model, just like you've been doing all the way up to this point, right? Sim, link, whatever you want to do, uh, same procedure. And then you mix them in the right proportions. And you could do this manually. And in, in previous iterations of this course, I was cruel and I did make people do it manually. And they thanked me for it because they developed Stockholm Syndrome, as I keep saying, over this. But uh, as I'll show you on the next slide, I now have a utility in the rethinking package that automatically does these steps uh, for you. Um, and I know you guys are already fighting with it on your homework because you're, you have, you're for thinking people and you're good at time discounting, right? <laughs> so, uh, actually, that's what's great about uh, grad students at this campus. You guys think like 10 years ahead, right? You're like, I want this kind of job. And so <laughs> you're good at planning backwards. Um, so why do we do this? Well, because these ensembles routinely outperform the predictions of any single model, even the one with the highest weight. Uh, because every model is overconfident to some extent. And so the ensemble often does better. This is really big in, in lots of areas of prediction. Um, where accuracy is important. Uh, in climate science, everything's an ensemble, right? Uh, last, last year, we actually had some climate scientists in the front row, and they were grooving on this section. They, they told me lots of interesting things about that. Literature. I don't know if we have any more. But occasionally, physical scientists wander into this class, and I always like you guys to so you mix things up. Um, so let's see how to do it. Uh, here's an example with the uh, primate milk data, again, to stick with that same data set. And uh, when I left you guys last week, we had fit um, a series of four models uh, to this. Uh, uh, they're listed down here on the bottom, uh, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14. 6.11 .1 is the intercept-only model. It has no predictors. 6.12 and 6.13 have one of the predictors each. Um, one's body size is one of the predictors, and the other was neocortex proportion, right? Am I remembering this? Yeah, you got to check me. I only wrote the book. And then 6.14 has both of them. <laughs> right. And uh, so let me, let's focus on the top left for a moment. Let me say that is just the same sort of code you've always seen where we generate the predictions for one of the models. And in particular, this is that model that we're generating um, posterior predictions for is 6.14. So it's the highest ranked model by far. It has the most, most weight. Uh, and in the graph in the upper right, those predictions are shown by... Uh, the dashed uh, uh, trends here. There's a dashed line in the middle. That's the posterior prediction for mu as a function of neocortex proportion. And then the dashed intervals, that's the best model only, showing you the, the uncertainty, the confidence bound around that average. Right? Makes sense? Uh, so there's nothing surprising about that code. You've seen it all before. It's, it's the usual business where we construct counterfactual predictions and plot them up. Now, down at the bottom, we're going to do the same thing for all of the models at once in an ensemble, and it's made automagical by this function called ensemble. And what ensemble does is it does exactly what the procedure on the previous slide. It just calls Lincoln Sim. That's really all it does, literally. Inside of it, go ahead and type ensemble with nothing else on your R prompt, and you'll get the raw code for it, and you'll see that it just calls Lincoln Sim. Um, with maybe some error checking, I forget. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and what it returns is a list with two elements, two matrices. The first one's called link, and that's the output of link. And the second one's called sim, and that's the output of sim. And you can extract them as you need them. So in the second line, we summarize just as before. We apply to our milk ensemble the link element. Uh, over the columns, we want the mean. And then we get the, um, 
percentile interval, same way over the columns we get percentile intervals. And then we plot them and do the shading on the same graph. Now the solid line in the middle is the ensemble mean prediction. Notice it's almost exactly the same. There's only the slightest little difference. And I use means here so you can see some difference. If you use the median, it would be almost exactly the same. right? And medians are usually better. But I'm using the mean because means are sensitive. Uh, but look at the shaded region now, because now the confidence interval uses all the models. And those lower rank models, yeah, they're unlikely. Uh, but they make extremely pessimistic predictions about the relationship, the predictive relationship about between neocortex proportion and uh, milk energy. And so it has a big effect on the shape of the confidence region, right, the whole thing. So, and this is a routine thing that happens, is your risk changes a lot in this, and you see those rare events. Um, so if you're doing something like an extinction analysis, this is priceless, right, because the rare events are what kill leopards. Right, or whatever it is you want to say. Yeah. Um, so if you add more models, will the confidence interval always get bigger, or will it sometimes get smaller and sometimes get bigger? Uh, the question was, if you add more models, will it always get bigger, or will it sometimes get smaller? I think if it changes at all, it's got to get bigger, right? Uh, so, the, But it depends upon the whole portfolio of models. It absolutely does, and what happens with the shape. Um, all, all kinds of stuff could happen. If these were complicated polynomials, remember from the... Uh, Tuesday last week with those weird polynomials and I put the prediction regions, you get weird snake shapes and all kinds of stuff happening. It depends upon the details. But I think if it changes at all, it's got to get bigger in some area. Um, it would make more sense here. You could plot up the contours by doing shaded regions of different percents. That's the 95%. But if you did like a 50 and, a, and an 80 and a 95, you'd see that, that it's actually, the topography is interesting. And there, there's this broad, flat plane basically out here that includes zero for the low range models. That makes some sense. Yeah. So it depends upon the case. There was another hand. Maybe it was auto grooming. No. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um. When the, did the ensemble function take the weights into account automatically? Yes. Okay. Yes. The question was, does ensemble take the weights into account automatically? Yes. It takes those list of models and it just calls WAIC for each of them. It gets those, calculates the weights. Um, there's a there's a function in the rethinking package called IC weights and it. If you just pass it any information criteria values you like, it returns weights back. Uh, and so it calls that internally. Um, does this make sense, what's going on? So you've got that homework problem where you're going to do something with this, and then you'll get the idea. And we'll be using it uh, to continue through the quarter. Um, but it's, un it's, it's important to understand this is convenient, but mechanistically it's just doing that top part for each of the models and then mixing them together in the right proportions. Yeah? I'm not sure I understand the zero part of this. You said that you have to remove Average over multiple models that includes zero or something. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So in this case, the thing is uh, a zero slope. So the lowest rank model has a slope of zero. The lowest rank model is the well. It's not even the lowest rank model. The second rank model is the null model, I think, in this case, something like that. And I forget the details. Uh, but there's some weight assigned to the intercept only model, which makes a horizontal line prediction uh, between kilocalories per gram of milk and neocortex percent. And this ensemble is capturing that. That's why that shaded region includes a slope of zero. So that's more. There's more uncertainty carried over with the ensemble. Absolutely, always, because it uses all the model predictions exactly. And sometimes, depending upon how risk averse you want to be in your prediction, it'll capture these extremely unlikely, but perhaps catastrophic things. Right and here, there's no catastrophe. It's not, you know, whatever. But again, if you're doing like population viability analysis, uh, this is precious stuff to do. I think you want to use an ensemble of some kind. Well, I don't know who was first, David. Um, so one of the models, if I'm wrong about this, one of the models that we're testing here does not use new, forgetting just the intercept model. Yeah. We have a model that has a predictor that's not neocortex, right, and does not include neocortex. That's right. Um, what I'm not quite understanding is if that model is a good predict predictor of kilocalories per gram, then isn't it by definition that the, uh, the the relationship in that model between neocortex percent and kilocalories per gram is zero. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there are two models that predict horizontal lines on this graph in the counterfactual universe, right, which is what we're drawing out. Now, I emphasize the counterfactual part because, of course, in reality, all of these things are correlated necessarily by the biology of real primates, and you can't actually make an ape that magically disentangles body mass from from the other things, right? 
uh, once we get a laboratory and do unethical experiments. So right. if you have a second <laughs> good predictor, other than neocortexes, yeah. you take a model without neocortexes, yeah. you're going to get somewhere in your um, ensemble confidence envelope, you're going to get a zero, you're going to get a plus zero. You're pretty likely in this to dimension, in this dimension. In, this in the other dimension, it's not. And But all the in models go into this, and so they're, yeah. So it's like there's a combined weight for two models that are pessimistic about the relationship between neocortex and kilocalories per gram. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there more. Sorry, the, the visual field I need for this classroom is really <laughs> like. Sorry, I have Katrina. One more. Yeah. So say so say you only have two models. You have a null model, and then you have a more complicated model that does a better job of predicting, and then. If you put those together, then you'll get probably something like this, right? Yeah. This null. But then, say you have another model that's almost exactly like your model that does a better job of predicting. Then, if you put all three of those together, wouldn't that like weight the null model less? <coughs> even though those two non-null -null models are basically like the same thing. Not necessarily. No. It, it, I think uh, this would be this is a great idea for a homework problem. I should I should make this. Uh, if you've got two identical models, you can try it this way. Just take the same model and fit it twice and give it two yeah. different names, put them in the set, it'll divide the weight between them. But isn't it like the independent? Same. Isn't like WAC like independently? Yeah, but they'll have the same deviance, and now you'll have a list with the same deviance replicated twice, or the same same AIC or WAIC replicated twice, and then your worst one. But your null model isn't going to change in size, so the proportion that you out like that's right. So it'll it'll like it'll. So I'm saying you should do this experiment and see what okay. happens, and you can predict it entirely from the adjusted the estimated out sample deviance. That's what's going to happen okay. exactly, and you'll see it. It does matter. Uh, so you don't want to do that. You don't want to replicate the model and put it multiple times. It'll shift the pie a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. Isn't, isn't that like concerning? Yes, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely it is. So I mean, if I understand your question, I mean, uh, the, it's up to us to decide which models to use, and there's no way the statistics can automatically discover mistakes like this. Well, uh, because unlike if you put two predictors that are the same, then it will tell you something is wrong, basically. But if you put two models that are the same, it will just weight it twice as much, and that seems like really problematic. It doesn't weight it. But again, you can do it. I don't think okay. we're understanding one another. You do it, and you'll okay. see what happens. Uh, but this is a great idea for a homework problem, so maybe I'll put it in a, next week or something like this. This is a great idea, actually. This is a good philosophical issue. And, and yeah, there's no general fail-safe device in this business, right? These are golems, and they will wreck problems. <laughs> Absolutely. And now, listen, I don't want to terrify you. Uh, we can be sensible about this, and in this case, the idea is theory has nominated the set of predictors. We've got here two of them, and we're worried about each overfitting, so we tried the obvious main effect candidate models. And this week we'll also look at the possibility of doing an interaction and what those correspond to. But you've got to use your, your domain knowledge to decide, otherwise you're in big trouble. Um, sensitivity analysis though, is a great thing. If you don't have domain knowledge, then I always tell people, well, vary the assumptions and see if it makes a difference and report whatever happens, if that makes sense. So I have no reassuring message other than that. But uh, this is my general message that, that statistics is no substitute for science, right? <laughs> it's like uh, often, I mean, it is a funny thing to say because, of course, no one's going to disagree with that statement. Right. But often people act like they want statistics to substitute for the scientific process, which takes generations to operate in many cases. And there's just no guarantee that any statistical procedure can discover the truth. That's just not what they're good at. Yeah. Sometimes you get new kinds of data that allows you to explore new theories and figure out how much of what you're looking at is the same. Yeah, and that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> that's fine. But again, there's. There, it would be really bad to say that statistics is substituting for science, right? Because you're just exploring things. And the, the contentious discussion uh, of the scientific community is what makes progress there when progress happens. It's not always. But <laughs> is that, I think we agree. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong. I'm going to get to, there's a slide in a little bit of maybe about this. We'll get there, the, the curse of Tippecanoe. Uh, when we get there in a second. Okay. So about ensembles. Um, that's how you do ensembles, and that's all the all the tricks you need for doing your homework. Um, so, yeah, yeah. It was technical, but the weights, what do they represent exactly? It's like the probability that it, because, I don't know, every time I tried to think of how to define it, it was like, well, the probability that you're right, well, it's not actually. The probability, the, the standard uh, kind of uh, out of sample, if we did a bunch of trials with these models using these estimates, and the the 
in simulation, what happens is the weights correspond to the probability that each model makes the best, has the best out of sample deviance on any particular resampling procedure. Um, and in, in nice Gaussian context and simulation studies, it is like that. As, as I said before, I'm nervous about the definition, uh, but um, it, pragmatically, it works pretty well. I think uh, heuristically, you can just think of them as a rescaling of the distances, uh, uh, estimated KL divergence distances between the models, so that um, when a mo as a model approaches one in the set, it's so much cl so much closer to the target, relatively speaking, than the other models that it's a slam dunk better. Uh, it's almost sure to make the better prediction. Does that make, does that help? Um, there is squish about this, and it, it's actually statisticians don't agree. Uh, and I've, I've said this to you guys sometimes, and, and some of you come to me in office hours, and those of you who are in my department, you hear this all the time, that what's fun about the field of statistics relative to, say, the field of biology uh, is that in statistics, everybody uses many of the same model types and inference procedures, but they disagree about what they mean. So statisticians are philosophically contentious people, and uh, at least until very recently. And uh, so, uh, whereas... I mean, so they fight all the time about how to interpret a regression coefficient, uh, but they all use regression. <laughs> and it isn't like in biology, we're fighting about the new applications. We don't fight about, you know, basic issues like, does natural selection happen? Yeah, it happens. Okay, so we should move on. But statisticians, it's like you scratch any topic and immediately blood gushes forth. <laughs> and, and you go to, like, statistics blogs, it's like this. The, the, There'll be a post that's about some new regression method and basically crickets, right? No one cares. But if there's a post about... How should we advise people to interpret a linear regression coefficient? You get like hundreds of contentious replies of people arguing about Bayesian philosophy. It can go on forever. It's fascinating. It's really, as an anthropologist, I study people for a living, right? This is, this is, this is all data for me. This is incredible. And, and I would say it's bad. It's just the flip side of most fields where the foundations are secure. Uh, uh, and in statistics, the applications are secure. And the foundations are still heavily debated about what they mean. It's, it's fascinating and fun. And this is not making you feel good, I can tell. <laughs> but don't worry. It's, it's, it'll, you'll get some experience here. Um, okay. Let's talk about New York blizzards. So there was a blizzard in New York. Does anyone remember? I mean, no, you guys, we're, we're out here in California, so we're like, ha! Ah. <laughs> but, uh, right? You people on that other side of the country <laughs> um, where there's water. <laughs> but... Uh, no, so that they, they basically shut the city down, and then the blizzard didn't really happen. I mean, it was technically a blizzard, but it was like the roads were never even covered. It was a, a trivial thing uh, for the Northeast. And lots of people then got angry at the governor and the National Weather Service and lots of stuff. And this is an interesting case where you think about ensembles. So did they make the wrong prediction? So they were predicting like 30 inches of snow uh, falling in New York City, and that's why they shut things down. New Jersey, too. Uh, shut down. And it turns out, if you if you do the triaging on this and follow the paper trail of what happens, um, uh, almost everybody was basing their forecasts on a model from uh, what's called the ECMWF, the European Commission for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And they had this model that made a really extreme prediction of more than 30 inches of snowfall in New York City. Most of the other models that were available um, made, like, predicted like 8 inches, which was a lot closer to what happened. Um, but everybody went with this with the, the catastrophe model uh, to do predictions on it. And the question is, was that bad or not? Now, I don't think this is an easy thing to decide, actually, um, for a couple reasons. Now, it depends upon the idea. I think the criticism comes about by they're saying, you called it wrong, uh, meaning it was an inaccurate forecast. And yes, it was, but it was a risk-averse forecast. So it's true. If they had used the ensemble, if you had taken all the available snowfall accumulation predictions and the times in which they were going to happen and done model averaging on them, you wouldn't have shut down New York City. Absolutely correct. Available imp the information available at the time, if you constructed a prediction ensemble from it, it would have been more accurate. Ensembles win. Absolutely true in weather forecasting. And every meteorologist knows that. Uh, nevertheless, that was not the job of the mayor. The mayor's job was not to, to call it accurately. The mayor's job was to present, prevent disaster and stay in office. <laughs> right? And both of those things mean being risk averse. Uh, so they shut things down because there was a credible forecast from a very well-respected group of meteorologists. The ECMWF it calls things really well much of the time. And uh, uh, they said there was a high probability of as much as 30 inches of snowfall, so they shut it down. The welfare considerations aren't the same as accuracy. 
And this is what makes prediction so frustrating. So the, the people here who do some applied biology, conservation biology, you know this, of course, right? Because this is your business. If you're doing reserve design or, or restoration projects or, or population viability analysis, you're not interested with the, in the average outcome. That's not your problem, right? The extreme disastrous outcomes of the problem. So you want risk-averse predictions. You want to behave towards some estimate other than the posterior median. And that's a different problem is all I want to say about that. Does that make some sense, though? So um, I think the criticism of the, of the National Weather Service on this is a bit overblown because they always call things uh, in a risk-averse way. Like when hurricanes are coming ashore, uh, they always exaggerate the potential wind speeds because they want to stop people from surfing. Right, which is what happens because why chromosomes? Right, <laughs> it's like it's like you know you tell young guys there's going to be big waves and they're like, dude. <laughs> so they have to exaggerate the potential damage to save lives. It's a different problem than accuracy, and you just got to keep this straight. For those of us who do basic research, myself included, the accuracy criterion is often a clear and important one. But if you're doing applied things, or someone will use your science for some, some applied goal, it's a different problem, actually. And accuracy is not what we want. Uh, it's a funny business. You know, those of us who study human evolution, you know, accur accuracy would be a great goal if we can get there. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. But then you have the problem of people not listening to you, right? Mm, yeah, that's usually my problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. So on that topic, uh, let me think. So. One of the things people do when you, you, you can get drunk on information criteria, you can start trying every possible structural model you can think of. And this, this sometimes happens. And, uh, uh, and I, I just want to warn you off doing this too flippantly. There are times you can justify it. Like if you've got new data and you have no idea what's going on and you just want to explore. But this runs afoul of the false positive problem. right? So if you've got a bunch of potential predictors and their interactions, which you'll start learning about today, and you just start trying a bunch of models, eventually some model will excite, the sample will excite that model a lot and look really good. Uh, and that's just the, the, even if the false positive rate of signals like that is low, if you try enough models, it will happen. Uh, this is a basic problem. And I want to help you memorize this and, and keep it in mind by thinking about William Henry Harrison, uh, perhaps the, the United States' worst president ever. <laughs> perhaps. Go read his Wikipedia page and see if you agree with me. If not the worst, second worst. Uh, really a terrible person. <laughs> but uh, that aside, um, there's this great story where he had where uh, he was he was because of the terrible things he did. He was cursed by the Native Americans, uh, and he died um, shortly into office. Um, and ev and then for uh, decades afterwards, every U.S. president who was elected in a year ending in zero, the first was William Henry, Henry Harrison, uh, died in office. And I think it was Harrison. He died. Uh, just a few weeks into his first term, because he caught pneumonia while giving his ex his uh, acceptance speech, right? It was so just, long, like four hours. <laughs> yeah, something like that, right? It's just, and he deserved it. <laughs> but uh, okay, go read his Wikipedia page. I mean, <laughs> genocidal maniac. He was a genocidal maniac. That's why. Uh, anyway, that takes the laugh off of it. But there you go. <laughs> um, so anyway, he was called Old Tippecanoe because of this uh, big battle. He was a general fighting against Native Americans. Uh, Battle of Tippecanoe. So anyway, so Lincoln after him, Garfield, McKinley, Harding, and F.D. Roosevelt all succumbed to this curse. Um, I don't believe in this curse, but they all, they were elected in a year ending in zero and they died in office. Um, uh, J.F. Kennedy was the last, assassinated in 1963. Um, Ronald Reagan broke the curse. He was elected in 1980, uh, despite at least two assassination attempts <laughs> that we know about, uh, managed to live uh, but through both of his terms and the curse was broken. Right, right there. So, you know, uh, uh, assign any significance to that you like. <laughs> uh, anyway, I don't believe in the curse, but this is a great example of how if you search for enough coincidences in any sufficiently long data set, you will find something really compelling like this. Doesn't it seem compelling? Look at all of these presidents. They're elected in year and zero. They died in office. In tragic circumstances, the curse worked, right? No, <laughs> the curse did not work. You can play, you go on the internet, you can find all kinds of creative games with the letters in presidential names, right? There's all kinds of Kabbalah-esque things about, about the numerology with, with presidential names. And it is fascinating, it's just that it's a high dimensional data set, uh, presidential elections. Even though you think it's a small sample size, there are a lot of dimensions to it. And if you dredge through those predictors long enough, you will find something really exciting. And this is the curse of Tippecanoe and statistics. If we dredge through enough model types, we'll find something that fits the sample really well. And of course, with presidential elections, you've got to wait a long time for the sample to replenish, right? They're, the country hasn't been around that long. 
there aren't that many presidents. Um, so the, the take home message, if you try all possible models, you're bound to overfit in some tragic ways. Uh, the first uh, recipe for this is not to fit all possible models, instead be thoughtful about what's going on. Uh, I know that's often hard, and, and I grant, sometimes there are new data sets and you just want to dredge and see what's there, but you have to be playful with it, right? Not take it as a hypothesis testing situation. Model averaging helps a ton, because if you have a ton of models, the cursor typically will be in there and it'll do well, but there'll be lots of other models that drown out its weight and it'll get spread down and it'll have a smaller effect on prediction, right? So model averaging is a way to guard against, guard against this to some extent. Um, and, uh, but yeah, we should be transparent about what we're doing here, I think, is, is if we pre-register our analyses, then it's hard to get away with these things, right? Okay, does this make sense? Um, I want to get to interactions today. I'm almost there. Uh, so last thing I want to say, because I feel guilty that, that I'm encouraging guys to always use simple models, Sometimes the complex model is the right model to use. Uh, in particular, all this information criterion stuff, you don't always have to do it. If you've got a particular model nominated by theory, then that's the one you fit to your data, and that's the one you talk about. Uh, you still want to worry about overfitting, but you might just use regularizing priors, and that's fine. Uh, but that's what people want to know about. If, if your community wants to know about the impact of country music on suicide, then that's what you estimate, right? And then you report that estimate. And then you talk about, well, this is probably overfit to the sample, so we might worry it's overfit, but under these estimates, you know, the plausible range of, you can only explain this many suicides or something like that. Uh, so it's just to say, you can always lean on theory, and you don't have to compulsively use inflammation criteria, um, but they're a good tool for measuring the overfitting risk in, a, in an ensemble of models. Um, uh, theory's a good thing to use. Okay. All right, let's, let's shift to, um, let's shift to interactions. Uh, so, so the most basic uh, uh, concept in statistical modeling that, that lets us get somewhere with inference <coughs> is a phenomenon called conditioning. So let me introduce uh, or reintroduce conditioning to you in a different way using two um, true stories about data. So on the top, does anybody know what these things are? If you've read ahead, you do. But those are manatees uh, in schematic form from a particular um, manatee sanctuary in northern Florida. And manatees had uh, the only natural predator of the manatee is, uh, is the speedboat, right? And uh, sometimes slow speedboat, but a propeller boat. And these uh, scar marks that you see on these bowling pin like figures are the propeller scars. Uh, and almost all living manatees in Florida have some propeller scars. So you can go and audit them. Actually, there are studies of this because the, the Florida Wildlife Commission um, checks these things out. And you can ID individuals from their propeller star patterns. Um, and so this has led to public campaigns to put cages on propellers, for example, right? So you, those of you who work in the Delta, you might know this, you have these cages that enclose the propellers on the boats. And, and those are good things, uh, unless plants get caught up in them and your boat stops, right? Uh, but that, that protects the manatees to some extent. But it turns out it doesn't help the manatees very, very much to protect the, to guard the propellers because propellers aren't what kill manatees. Think about this for a second. Here's the selection effect that we're driving towards the conditionality. We're only talking about living manatees. The dead ones have fewer propeller scars on them. Because what mainly kills a manatee is the keel of the boat. And you can put that in a cage and it doesn't matter. <laughs> right? It still hurts them. Conditional on being alive, propellers hurt manatees. But they don't, they don't kill them very often. They're painful. Don't get me wrong. It's a horrible thing. We should, we should cage the propellers. But what the major threat is the keel of the boat. And the, well, the major threat is that there are boats. <laughs> That's the major threat. Uh, so you make the wrong inference. And, you, and, and for the longest time, people focused on the propeller. But it was completely wrong. They missed the conditionality of the sample. They're only looking at living manatees. Uh, conditional on surviving, uh, the keel probably didn't hit you. And so you don't see keel, keel wounds. You do autopsies of dead manatees at the bottom of ponds, you see the opposite pattern. Uh, does that make some sense? All right, that was depressing. I'm sorry. Manatees are adorable. So, um, The bottom is a, a famous story from statistics. Um, uh, I say a little bit about it in a little history box in, in the book. Uh, these are uh, uh, World War II bombers and um, with bullet holes in them, uh, simulated bullet holes. I drew those myself with a very careful formula, as you can well imagine. And uh, so there was this common problem the Royal Air Force had with these bombers that they came, came back from missions, dropping bombs and pamphlets into Germany. And uh, uh, during the war, um, 
the, the Royal Air Force was severely limited in raw materials. They wanted to up armor their aircraft to help them survive better. So they asked, where should we put additional armor? We can't armor the whole plane, both because we don't have enough armor, and they wouldn't be able to get off the ground if we did, because they'd be too heavy. So where should we put the armor? And so the first idea is, well, let's look where the bullet holes are, and let's put armor there. But this is exactly the opposite of what you want to do. Conditional on having returned from a mission, <laughs> the bullet holes are in places that don't matter, right? <laughs> and, and this is not obvious, but it is the right answer. So notice, for example, none of these planes have bullet holes in the cockpit. <laughs> if there was a bullet hole in the cockpit, the plane didn't come back. And uh, anyway, this is a famous story in statistics, and there are some interesting papers on it that I cite uh, in the book if you're interested. Um, but all of these are both examples of where the sample we have available is conditional on one of the things we want to make an inference about. And these are poisonous situations for inference, but we can make progress in them. But we have to be careful about conditionality. So what we're going to talk about mostly this week, the remainder of this week, is interaction effects, which is one way of getting more conditionality into the models. An interaction is a way to make the influence of a, of a predictor variable conditional on the values of one or more other predictor variables. Often nature is like that uh, in subtle ways. Uh, everything in statistical <laughs> inference is conditional on something, either on the data. Everything's always conditional on the data we have at hand, like in the manatee and the bomber case. Um, inference is always conditional on the model, right? That's why I want you to think about them as golems, uh, little, little constructs, nothing necessarily true about them. Um, and also on our priors, or as I like to think about it, the information state that the machine begins with. When it makes its inference, inference is conditional on that. It may be only weakly conditional on it, but it's still conditional on it. And interactions are a way of constructing linear models that ask questions about how the influence of a predictor on an outcome is conditional on the values of other predictors. And we'll have some examples of this as we go. The simplest one to think about, though, uh, and I assume most of you drink coffee and or tea, right, because uh, you all need caffeine in your lives, is uh, you, add, you can add... Adding sugar to coffee by itself doesn't really sweeten it very much. Um, and stirring your coffee by itself doesn't sweeten it either. But doing both sweetens it a lot. <laughs> I'll say that again. Adding sugar by itself to your coffee doesn't actually sweeten it very much. And you know why? Because you get this sludge at the bottom of, right, a syrup collects on the bottom of your coffee cup. And you mainly don't get that until the very end. And then it's delicious, isn't it? <laughs> and, and stirring does nothing for the sweetness, probably. <laughs> I don't know. It could be a placebo effect. Uh, but if you do both, then the sweetness goes up a lot. And that's an interaction effect. If you had a dummy variable for added sugar and a dummy variable for stirred by coffee, uh, the main effects are nothing, uh, the things we've been examining so far. But when both happen together, there's a big change in the sweetness of the coffee. Does that make sense? So we want to see how to do that and how to interpret these effects as we go. Um, oh, yeah, I have it on. I should have advanced. There it is. Influence of sugar in coffee depends upon stirring. Uh, the influence of a gene on a phenotype depends upon the environment, biologists, right? This has been drilled into you since day one. Um, the influence of skin color on cancer depends upon latitude, something I'm acutely aware of in my family. And uh, those of you who can't see me on the screen, I'm of Irish descent. Uh, <laughs> generalized. Uh, so, and then we're going to master these things in the context of ordinary linear models with Gaussian likelihoods, where it's easy, where inference is pretty benign. Um, uh, and then when we get to generalized linear models in a couple of weeks, um, everything necessarily will interact, even if you don't explicitly put in an interaction effect, because there will be what we call ceiling and floor effects on the outcome. And you don't have to understand that right now. This is just a promise that when we get there, you're going to have to deal with this issue. Um, and multi-level models, uh, part of their power comes from the fact that they are essentially massive interaction engines, where you interact every parameter with the identity of the case it comes from, of the entity in the data it comes from. And you can estimate tens of thousands of parameters that way and make quite powerful infer inferences about the variation in response in the population. And that's incredibly useful, especially in cases where the average effect is not of interest. Right? So think about like pharmaceuticals. Uh, not everybody benefits from taking aspirin. Uh, the mean effect is not of interest. Right? The variation, and what predicts that variation is what's of interest. So you're going to need to inter understand interactions to get multi-level models as well. So that's why I'm going to spend the rest of this week on it. It seems like a pedestrian thing. Usually there's like three pages on it in a textbook. Um, I gave it a whole chapter, which seems, you know, uh, uh, pretty dumbed down compared to, well, the chapter that came right before it was like information theory, right? Uh, but I think this is actually subtle. 
And um, lots of professional scientists never got a good education in interaction effects, and I think make mistakes as a consequence. Not their fault, right? They're victims of a curriculum. Um, so let me use a, introduce a new data example that we'll stick with for, for the rest of today, I bet. Um, uh, here's a data set uh, where we're looking at the, the correlation between something called terrain ruggedness across countries and the uh, log GDP in the year 2000. Uh, this is called real GDP, so it's currency adjusted and, and all of that. Um, so think of this as a crude measure of the uh, economic uh, uh, performance of a country and some feature of its geography. And terrain ruggedness index, I give you a little bit more information in an endnote in the book, is, is something geographers figured out that has to do with the energetics of movement. It's about transportation expense uh, is the idea. Uh, but the idea is it's it's big in countries like Nepal here in the graph in the lower right, right? Nepal, very rugged. There's no flat land in Nepal. Shouldn't say that. There's probably a little bit of flat land somewhere. And uh, and Kyrgyzstan, uh, Lebanon, surprisingly rugged. Uh, and uh, Switzerland, famously so, right? All mountains, little few villages in between. Yeah, everybody stole the Nazi gold. Sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> right? um, and Tuzik said, uh, and then uh, there are lots of countries which are pretty much uh, flat uh, on the other end. There are lots of variations. Um, so globally here I'm showing you, if you just fit a linear regression, uh, uh, predicting log GDP in the year 2000 by terrain ruggedness, in general, countries with rugged terrain have poor performing economies. And this has been known about for a long time. It's transportation is, is more expensive, and that hurts markets uh, is the idea. Uh, and it's not so far-fetched. It makes a lot of sense. And countries go out of their way to deal with these issues, blasting holes through mountains and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, and it can help the economy quite a lot. Now, but here's the thing we're going to explore. The impact of ruggedness depends upon continent. So um, let's split the sample. So I'm, gonna, I'm fitting two linear regressions on two separate samples now. I've taken all the African countries out and put them in one data set and run a linear regression on the left here that I'm showing you the lower right. Same variables, log, real GDP in, in the year 2000. Um, then also, I say this is per person, so it's adjusted for the population. Right? Uh, some economies are bigger than others. Um, against trained ruggedness, the slope is positive in Africa. There's a lot of uncertainty because there are fewer countries, um, but uh, the, the, the posterior median is definitely positive. Uh, and it barely, uh, the 95% interval barely hits zero there. Um, the rest of the world, uh, is on the right, and it's still the same relationship, still quite reliably negative, which would make sense. So the question is, what's going on here? Uh, this is a classic interaction effect where um, the relationship between the outcome and the predictor rugged depends upon something else. And in this case, it's a binary variable, whether you're in Africa or not, you being a country. Right? You are Nigeria. Congratulations. You have a lot of oil. Um, what we want to do, though, is do this in the same model. Right. Uh, this what we've done here is is very illicit in a sense. We've constructed two samples, so we've given up uh, a, a good amount of statistical knowledge. Splitting the data is bad because you get no estimates about the reliability of the split. We'd like to be able to do that, and we'd like to be able, um, uh, although I don't say it on this slide, I forgot to put it in. We'd like to be able to do a model comparison between the model with the interaction, where we take into account continent, and one without that. And yet, these are, we've now got three data sets, right? One with just Africa, one with the continents that, aren't, that exclude Africa, and then the whole world. And model comparison with information right here requires that all the models be fit to exactly the same sample. Uh, so that will work. And also, there are parameters like sigma in the linear regression, um, which want to use the whole sample, even if you have interaction effects. And when you split the sample, you don't get to use all that data to estimate those common parameters. Uh, so we don't get to pool, is what I say here, pool information in that way. And when we get to multi-level models, we'll actually be able to do pooling across the continents and do even better. Uh, you can wait to understand that until we get there. So how do we do legitimately do an interaction effect? Um, it's pretty easy, uh, but first let's start with what doesn't work, <laughs> just to, to train your intuitions up to it. Um, putting in a dummy variable for Africa definitely doesn't work, because all this does is allow Africa to have a different intercept uh, in the regression line. So that's what I'm showing you here. Here's the linear regression. Uh, where we've got uh, little r sub i is the ruggedness for country i, uh, and capital A sub i is an indicator variable whether the country is in Africa or not. 
Um, so the effect of this coefficient beta sub a is just to change the height, change the intercept in effect. It adds a constant to the, to the value from u or not, moves it up and down. And you can see that in the predictions here. Uh, the blue um, predicted trend is uh, for Africa, and the black one is the non-African countries, all plotted up here. You'll see they have the same slope because the model requires them to. Because the only thing that affects the slope of this line is the coefficient in front of ruggedness. Uh, but the height of the line can change. So all this regression tells you is that on average African countries have lower GDP. Right? But we knew that, colonialism, et cetera. Right? We, knew, we have explanations for that, what's going on. We're interested in the ruggedness effect, which we're getting nothing out of from this model. Um, so let's add a real interaction. Uh, think verbally what you want to do. We're asking the question. We want to write down a model that's, that answers the question, how does the effect of ruggedness depend upon continent? So we can approach this very brute force. Let's do that. We've got a parameter in this model, beta sub r, which is the model's answer to how the outcome depends upon ruggedness. Now we now we want to complex, make that parameter complicated. And here's what we're going to do. It's turtles all the way down. As I kept saying, we're going to take that parameter and we're going to make it a model. You're like, what? Okay. <laughs> yes. It's my favorite thing to do is take parameters and replace them with models. And uh, it's like the exhibit thing, right? We're going to pimp, pimp this model. And you like, you like models, so well, I'm going to put models in your model. Uh, and uh, see, I'm, you guys flatter me. You, know my, you understand my jokes. <laughs> or at least you're pretending. Uh, so let's just rename it for a second. Gamma sub i. And gamma is not going to be a parameter in the posterior distribution. It's just going to be a label for another linear model that I'm going to add in here. Um, where we redefine... The, the influence of ruggedness, the association between ruggedness and the outcome, is now a model itself, and it's a regression model that looks the same. Uh, it has an intercept, uh, beta sub r, which is the coefficient we had before, and then it has an adjustment when the country is in Africa. It gets an adjustment. So essentially this gives you two different slopes. Uh, uh, it gives you a slope beta sub r when the country is not in Africa, and it gives you a slope beta sub r plus beta a r, uh, when you are in Africa. And we'll step through this uh, uh, multiple times, so make sure you get it. So when we expect this thing, beta sub r, this is the old direct effect of ruggedness. Think about it that way. Um, and then there's a linear effect of Africa on the slope. And Africa here is discrete. It's 0 or 1. But if it were continuous, this works the same way. Uh, you're constructing a linear model of the coefficient. Uh, and this is what a classical interaction effect is. It's a linear model in a linear model. That's how it works. Does this make some sense? Uh, yeah? You're willing to keep trucking along at least for the moment? Here it goes. Uh, so there's a conventional presentation of this. Let me show you here. If you just uh, take gamma and substitute it into the mu line and expand, you get the conventional representation of an interaction model of this kind, where now we have three terms. There are two terms, the so-called main effects that we've been working with up to this point. And then there's a new term where you have the product of two predictor variables in it. And this just comes from the algebra of taking gamma here, putting it in there, and then expanding. And you'll get this. I leave that algebra to you at home because it's good for you. Okay. Um, so that's how you usually see it, and that's how we'll usually specify them in the models. But when you use MAP, you can actually put in as many linear models as you like. Now, don't call me on that, actually. There's probably a theoretical <laughs> which it'll explode. But it really just cascades from the bottom up and just keeps uh, substituting symbols to build the linear model all the way up into the likelihood. So in theory, you could have as many as you've got memory to do here. Um, so we just write it just like this, and it reflects uh, the two linear models we had before. And this fits fine. Um, and uh, first thing I want to show before we start inspecting the, the posterior distribution from this model is to just do the WIC comparison. Um, model 7.3 is the model uh, that doesn't include continent. Model 7.4 is the model that includes continent only as a main effect, no interaction. Right? And then model 7.5 is the interaction between ruggedness and continent. And uh, what I want you to see is it's pretty much a slam dunk for uh, the interaction model, uh, which you've got before when we looked at the split, right? That was a big difference. The slope changes direction almost completely. It flips. The sign basically changes uh, in and out of Africa. Um, uh, so... Let's march forward just looking at model 7.5 so we can keep the discussion easy. But if you want to go back through and do this with ensemble, that's a good exercise. Uh, make sure you understand it. It won't make much difference in this case, uh, but it's a good idea to keep it in mind. Okay. Uh, well, I should have showed this before. Uh, 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 
one of the models is reasonably close, but uh, uh, still does a much better job. Um, so there's probably some overfitting, I think, in, in the slope in Africa, and you have a homework problem at the end of this week where you look at that. So if you're doing an ensemble, could you possibly just want to only do it on the top two models or something? That would be equivalent, right, because the third one's got like zero weight, right, so okay, it would be the same. But you can put all three in and it's harmless, because the bottom one's essentially zero, and it'll get like one sample or something, right? Um, so let me show you, I'm just putting the predictions back. This is the, the plotting. Um, the results from the interaction model. The full code to do this is in the book. There are no surprises. Uh, it's just an issue of you're putting up the raw data for each continent, and then you compute counterfactuals across the horizontal, setting the Africa variable to one or zero. Uh, on, the, on the left, it's one. On the right, it's zero. And you get the different slope, because it turns one of the parameters on and off. Does this make sense? Um, and that's how you can figure out how these interaction effects work. Um, Let's look at uh, the, the Precy output. Um, interpreting interaction models from the coefficients is even harder than interpreting models uh, with, I mean, of course it's harder, but it's basically impossible. I, I'm really warning you off the idea that you can understand interaction effects by looking at coefficients. And I, I'm going to spend some time explaining why I think that. Now, if you get really pro at this, you can do it. Uh, but it's hard. And like I said, I see published mistakes all the time. Um, and remember, the Precy output, these are marginal posterior distributions, just summaries of their moments. And they don't show you anything about the covariance between them. And that's one of the major hazards that's going on here. Uh, the other hazard is that the, all the parameters change their meaning when you add an interaction effect. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that as well. This is all meant so that you don't try to interpret these tables, I'm afraid. Uh, that's what goes on. We'll have another example on Thursday where I spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, but I want to take my time going through this one because it's the first one so we can get it. So let's, let's spend some time trying to understand these parameter estimates. And I'm show you, you, you can do a little bit, but again, I want you to plot stuff instead and do counterfactual experiments. And then your readers will understand, because your readers will never understand your model as well as you do. Right? So if you're having trouble with it, right, just dumping it on the page and your reviewers kind of like not okay, uh, and then it gets published, uh, it'll go into the pits of lost science. Right? So, but if you make plots, counterfactual plots, then the readers can understand what the implications of the model are. Okay. Um, so here's the summary. I replicate the model up there for you just for reference, so you can see where the parameters go in. Right. So A is alpha, and BR is beta R, and B capital A is uh, 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 beta capital A over there, and B capital A little r is the so-called interaction coefficient, um, which expresses the conditionality of the relationship between ruggedness and the outcome on continent. So let's ask, where's gamma, first of all? Gamma's not a parameter in the posterior, it's, but it is conceptually important because it tells us the slope of the line connecting ruggedness and the outcome, log GDP. So if you want to compute it, and that's what you essentially do when you make those prediction plots, uh, you know the model so you can plug it in and say, take the expression for gamma. Um, in the case of a country in Africa, the, the slope, the relationship between ruggedness and log GDP uh, per person in the year 2000 will be the sum of both of those parameters, right? Because there's the, you plug in the, the value of the predictor, which is one <coughs> an indicator. Uh, so this is about minus two. I'm going to do some rounding because, you know, we're not launching space shuttles, as we keep saying. Your O-rings are not going to crack. Uh, do a little bit of rounding, right? And uh, ch eventually challenger jokes will no longer make sense to anybody. But, uh, <laughs> And it's definitely not too soon. That's what I like about them, right? <laughs> Some of you were not alive. Actually, a lot of you were not alive. Oh, my God. Um, am I old? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, uh, my age anxiety, anxiety aside, and this, this was obviously from a some point time when I used a different prior, sorry, <laughs> about 0.35. Uh, and you get an estimate of about 0.2 uh, for the slope in Africa. So positive, just about 0.2. And if we uh, do outside Africa... Uh, it'll just be the BR term. So it's just about negative 0.2, which is the flip on the other side of, the, of zero. Um, do you see how to construct this? Now, this is just, these are just math estimates, right? So there's still uncertainty around it. So let's, let's think about how to do that. We actually want the distribution of gamma in and out of Africa. That's what we want to make inferences about. And the difference between them, right? I'll say that again. What we actually want to make inferences about is the distribution of gamma, the posterior distribution of gamma in and out of Africa, and the difference in the posterior distributions of gamma in and out of Africa. So I, now this, this might be confusing. If you're paying attention, it will be, because I said gamma is not in the posterior. So how does it have a posterior distribution? 
Gamma is a function of parameters, and parameters have distributions. So anything that's a function of parameters also has a distribution. So that's why gamma has a distribution, a posterior distribution. And we can calculate it exactly as you've been doing stuff so far. Um, we extract samples from the posterior, and we use them as a substitute for doing integral calculus. Uh, this problem is all Gaussian, so integral calculus actually proceeds elegantly and beautifully, and it's actually a joy to do. Uh, but uh, some of you haven't had a course in integral calculus, and yet you're really superb scientists, and I'd like you to be able to do this. So as always, we're going to do it with the trick way of doing integral calculus, just using samples. Um, and remember, later on, we're only going to have samples when we use Markov chains. So you need to learn how to do this anyway, even if you're an integral calculus wizard. So extract samples. Um, we just use the formula for gamma, substituted into our code to do this. The first one, gamma.africa, is gamma for an African nation. Uh, we take the posterior distribution for BR. We add to that the posterior distribution for BAR times 1, because it's an African nation. Right? And it takes all the corresponding samples down, adds them up. We get as many values of gamma as we have samples from the posterior distribution. So we get a distribution, and that distribution is shown by the blue distribution here uh, in the graph on the bottom. Gamma in Africa centered on point 2, just as we learned before, but now we get the whole distribution. Yeah? Uh, you can see there is some a little bit, there is some probability below zero, right? There is a, the model says, yeah, there's like, you know, I don't know, a 3% chance that, that the slope is, is negative here, slightly negative. Does that make sense, what I'm saying so far? Yeah. Um, for not Africa, uh, same idea, but now we put a zero in there. Same function. Essentially, uh, as you can tell, that just gets rid of those, uh, and it's just the posterior distribution of BR. Uh, but that is the definition of gamma not in Africa, centered on minus 0.2, um, little bit above zero as well. Now here's the trick. You might be tempted, uh, as I've seen many unfortunate accidents in print do this, to look at the overlap between these distributions as an indication of how different they are. You cannot do that. That is wrong. Logically wrong. If you want to know the difference between two parameters, you, can, you, you must construct their contrast. Their contrast is the distribution of their difference. These two things are correlated, and you can't see the correlation on this graph. All use, these are marginal distributions. Right? There, there's a two-dimensional space here that's, that's not being shown very well. So how do we do that? Um, we just calculate the difference. Uh, and the difference is, I showed you the code in the book, you take gamma Africa and you subtract gamma not Africa, and you store that in a new symbol. That's the distribution of the difference. Right? It's that easy. That's what a contrast means. It's just the distribution of the difference. And the correlation structure is preserved in the samples always. Uh, as long as you keep the ordering right, uh, the correlation structure is preserved. Um, so I like this way of doing the course, right, instead of integral calculus, too. Uh, and then you can see the difference, even though both of those distributions overlap zero. So the model isn't completely sure uh, that Africa has a positive slope, and it isn't completely sure that the rest of the world has a negative slope, although it's pretty sure. Uh, it's almost perfectly confident that the difference is positive, that Africa has a bigger slope. So even if Africa has a negative slope, it's still the model thinks it's going to have a bigger slope than the rest of the world. Does that make sense? And that's the inference you're interested in here. Yeah? Okay. Some of you are, are liking this. And, I don't know. I'm trying to read your, your faces. I don't know. Tez is bored, I can tell. <laughs> He's thinking about wood ducks. Can you repeat how to calculate the... The difference, the contrast? Yeah. Yeah, you just take... Um, and the, the code is in the book. I apologize for not having it up here. You just take Gamma Africa... And subtract gamma not Africa, the symbols, and store that in a new symbol. And just call it diff <coughs> and plot that. And that diff will hold the vector of, of differences. And that's what that distribution that I show is. And that preserves all the covariance among them. Now you are thinking about wood ducks. I can tell by the smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> is that just the distribution of B AR of beta AR? Um, uh, it's the coefficient of interaction coefficient. No. It's no. not because there's a correlation between these differences, right? The, so this is, this is just like a profile view uh, of, the, of Gamma Africa, and here's a profile view of not Africa, but these two things are correlated with one another. So when, what the difference always being positive tells you is as Gamma Africa gets smaller in the posterior, so does Gamma not Africa. They're, they have a positive covariance, and that keeps the difference positive uh, almost always, except for like, I, I calculated in the book, it's like, like, uh, 0.038% or something like that, um, uh, or 3.8%, I forget what it is, uh, some really tiny amount, as you can see there. Uh, 
And it's because these two things are correlated. Yeah, so if you if you take this value here, you have to take a value down here. It's the idea. So then what is the inference of that parameter? Which parameter? Beta AR. Yeah, what's the meaning of beta AR? Yeah. Great question. We're, I think we're going to get to that on the, on the, if not the next slide, a little bit later. Uh, the quick answer is, when you ask what does the interaction coefficient mean, well, it's the adjustment to gamma <laughs> when the predictor changes. It, it doesn't have a clear, cognitively interpretable meaning on the outcome that people can easily wrestle with. It has a clear algebraic definition, but it's really hard to wrestle with verbally. And that's why I discourage you from trying to, like, you can't inspect it alone because the relationship between the predictor and the outcome now depends upon more than one parameter, and you want to process it. It is really tricky. Uh, and these covariances like this can actually lead you astray. You can get situations like in the left and right leg example where the fact that there's a really strong covariance between those two parameters, and it looks like the model thinks there's no relationship between leg length and height. But actually, the model predicts uh, that leg length and height are strongly related. You can get that in interaction effects, too, where just looking at the marginal distribution of the interaction parameter itself, it'll overlap zero a lot. But it co-varies with some other parameter, like the, the main effect. Uh, and so their sum may be reliably above zero right, because of that covariance. It's super frustrating, and it's, you know, golems, man. I don't know what to tell you. It's just how it goes. Uh, is this starting to make some sense, though? So tables of coefficients, train wreck. <laughs> nearly always, unless you're really pro at this, you can easily make mistakes. And the evidence of that is that famous scientists have published mistakes and in interpretation of their models through this. And I'm not going to call anyone out uh, because those people outrank me. <laughs> but, uh, but when they retire, I will come back to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Um, so let's think about, I've got a little bit of time here to do some useful stuff. So um, the thing about interactions too that makes interpretation a little bit tricky although I, I want to argue that this is this, we're going to turn this into a bonus, uh, is that they're bidirectional, logically bidirectional. Uh, at least linear interactions are. So if the effect of ruggedness depends upon continent, then it is necessarily true that the effect of continent also depends upon ruggedness. I'll say this again. Uh, if the effect of ruggedness depends upon continent, then it is necessarily also true that the effect of continent depends upon ruggedness. Even though they... When you say it in natural human language, they sound like different claims. In the algebra of the model, they're exactly the same logical relationship. And this is a very elusive and weird thing. And now, but here's the bonus. So, so the first thing to be careful of is, is you have to realize that you're asking both of these questions simultaneously when you define the model. The bonus is you can plot it both ways, and it often teaches us different things that we didn't realize before. It's like this amazing thing about math that it's all tautology, and yet you can learn from it, right? That's why I do it for a living. People pay me money for some reason to do totologies for a living, right? Because we somehow, it was all there in the assumptions, but we couldn't see it until we processed it. And that's what plotting it both directions is going to do. Uh, so I wanna, we're going to do that with the examples this week of interactions. And in your homeworks, when you do interactions, I encourage you to plot it both ways and get some comfort for it. It often teaches you different things. So let me show you algebraically why they're the same claim. Um, so I've taken gamma. Uh, in this linear model here, and I've just replaced it with its formula, right, in parentheses. Just plugged it in there. And uh, we can factor this now. So first I expand it to the conventional form of an interaction. And then we can refactor it so that we pull the uh, a sub i out of all the terms in which it's in. And now we've got uh, uh, the same gamma reappears again, right, but now with a different intercept. Uh, and now it's asking the question, so the gamma up here asked, how does the effect of ruggedness depend upon uh, continent? Now we're getting, how does the effect of continent depend upon ruggedness? Right, multiplied by the continent thing uh, out here. Same exact algebraic relationship. Uh, the, the math doesn't see any difference. You get the same estimates, no matter how you put it in. And that's why this middle line is usually the way we enter these models, because it sort of emits the bidirectionality of it. Uh, in the book, I use this. This uh, is an attempt to help you understand this, this tale of Burden's ass, which is this uh, strange uh, Greek logical paradox where there's, a, there's a, an ass, that uh, a donkey, that uh, has two piles of hay, I think it was in the classic story, and it's equidistant from both of them, and so it starves to death because you can't decide which to eat. Right? It's a silly logical puzzle. These are things that rich Greek people thought about in ancient <laughs> history. Uh, but these models are logically like this. There's no way in the model for you to decide which of these interpretations is correct because they're logically the same. 
and you can't make up the mind. But they're going to feel different to you in interpretation. Uh, you may learn different things from them, depending on how you visualize them. So let's plot it the other way now. Let's plot the effect of being in Africa as if it depended on ruggedness. What that means now is we, we fix ruggedness at different values in each graph, and we vary continent on the bottom, on the horizontal axis, still plotting GDP. And so this is just counterfactual predictions from the model. Uh, the only trick I've done here to make this a little bit more appealing is I've, I've faded out countries that are far from the ruggedness value on the top. So I'm using transparency on the raw data points that I've plotted to show all the ones that are in dark blue there have a ruggedness near the minimum. Uh, near zero. Um, so what we're seeing is here countries that are pretty flat, the model says that if, if we put them in Africa, their GDP goes down. That's what it says. Uh, now let's move up ruggedness a little bit to about the median ruggedness of about three. Uh, now it's still negative, but all, not very much. Uh, there are fewer countries out here, by the way. Most of the world is pretty flat, uh, by this index at least. Uh, but it's gotten, it's gotten uh, uh, ruggedness isn't nearly as bad now. And African countries, if you're a sort of median ruggedness country, it doesn't hurt you very much to be in Africa, which is what now what we're getting from this. It's like a different story, but it's actually the same story. And then finally, for countries with they're really rugged, there's a mild advantage uh, to being in Africa, actually. Um, so this is the story I told as uh, the effect of ruggedness depends upon, uh, the, the effect of being in Africa depends upon ruggedness. So it's this weird thought experiment of like, if I could take Switzerland and I could drop it in Africa, would it be better off? And the answer here is yes, it would be better off. Uh, now, of course, you can't do that. It's a weird counterfactual experiment. And that's the domain knowledge that prohibits this interpretation, right? Because usually the intervention would be, we can, we can level hills. We can change the ruggedness of a country, but we can't put a country in Africa. Right, so that's what means this interpretation is a little weird, and the other one makes a little bit more sense. Does that make some sense? Yeah, but still, you, this may help you understand the general phenomenon that's going on and what the model says. Okay? All right, I have 15 minutes. I can still do some good. Um, so yeah, here's looking at it both ways. At the top, we're looking at the interaction from the direction of the effect of changing continent depends upon the ruggedness. For flat countries, uh, putting something in Africa hurts its GDP. For really rugged countries, it either has no effect or even helps it a little bit. Uh, from the other direction, uh, uh, on the bottom is the classical direction. Uh, the effect of ruggedness depends upon continent. Outside of Africa, or rather in Africa, ruggedness helps you. African countries that are rugged, uh, on average, have better GDP. Uh, you'll, you'll notice, say, shells there is exerting a lot of leverage on this regression line, and you will have a, a homework problem where you take Seychelles out uh, so you can play around with this and get an idea. Um, that's the kind of thing you, you probably want to do in analyses like this. Um, and then for non-African nations, there's a strong negative relationship that doesn't really depend upon outliers. You can actually delete all the high ruggedness ones too, and it's still quite negative. Um, these are, I think you do learn something different from each of these. I think about it, in the bottom view, it's not clear um, uh, that the intercepts are different between these two graphs, right? Because notice that the vertical axes begin and end at different values. And so you sort of miss the effect in the default plotting setting. So the fact that the African countries on average are still worse off than the non-African countries. But you see that very well in the top because even at extreme ruggedness, African countries don't outperform the rest of the world. They just break even. And you see that in the top interpretation, right? So it captures the intercept better. So there's value in both. Does this make some sense? Uh, so plot, plot, plot. There's way more to get out of this plotting than you could ever get from the table of coefficients, which are just marginal posterior distributions. They, they elide all of the interesting covariances that are going on. Questions about this? No? Over, over the next day, some will arise. Maybe we'll keep going. Let me introduce the next example, uh, which we'll um, work through when you guys come back uh, on Thursday. Uh, we're going to work through uh, the... Uh, uh, Greenhouse data set on tulips. Uh, the evolutionary botanists in the room will be thrilled, perhaps, by this, or maybe you hate tulips. <laughs> but, uh, but hey, they're worth money, so people want to figure out how to grow them, right? And um, it's a nice experimental data set. It'll be the cleanest data set we look at in the course. Let me just introduce you to it uh, and the basic problem. This is a nice one because I think even if you're not an evolutionary botanist, you'll understand the biology because everybody knows something about plants, right? Maybe? No. Um, so... These data are 27 replicant blooms across three levels of water and shade treatment in, uh, in a greenhouse. So uh, there are 
three levels of water that are added and three levels of shade that are added. High levels of shade mean not much light is reaching the plant. Uh, high levels of water mean lots of water um, and not so much that it kills it. Um, uh, and what we're measuring here, I think, is the area of blooms is the outcome variable. So there's just three variables we're interested in. Blooms is going to be our outcome. Uh, it co-varies with water and shade. Uh, and you can kind of see if you squint in this pear spot in the top row, you can kind of see how it, there's a general positive relationship with water. And that makes sense. Plants need water. Everybody knows that. Even my five-year-old knows that. And uh, the, they're hurt by shade. The average bloom goes down. Bloom area goes down with shade. But there's a lot more going on in here because the effect of water depends upon shade and the effect of shade depends upon water. They're both necessary. Uh, or rather, light and water are both necessary for photosynthesis, right? Remember this? Was it Krebs cycle? Something like that? I can't remember. It's a long time ago that I did real biology. <laughs> and uh, so we want to look at, uh, in fact, we already understand in the context of an interaction model, so you can begin to debug what's going on. Um, so i got 10 minutes. Let me see how far into this I can get at a comfortable pace. Uh, so uh, first, let's fit... Uh, the no interaction model, I'm just going to state the interaction, no interaction models on this slide. The no interaction model is the first one. In this case, water and shade have independent effects. We just add them into the linear model. Uh, capital B is the bloom uh, variable. And then our, our linear equation for mu is an intercept. Uh, and then a coefficient times the water level, uh, which is going to be 1, 2, 3 in this data set. They're just our water levels. And 3 is 3 times as much as 1. Uh, they are metric in that regard. Um, and then a co plus a coefficient <laughs> times the shade amount. And shade is also 1, 2, 3, where it's uh, one third as much light reaching. Um, the interaction model, the second model on this slide, now the question is that water and shade have interdependent effects, and we want our little regression machine to tell us the extent to which each of these predictor variables, its impact on the outcome, the extent to which its impact on the outcome depends upon the value of the other. I'll say that again. What an interaction model asks is, to what extent does the impact of either of these predictor variables on the outcome depend upon the value of the other? Right? This is the, the burden's ass problem, right? that it's both interactions. So it's going to ask, what is the, uh, to what extent does the association between water and bloom size depend upon shade? And to what extent does the impact of shade on bloom size depend upon water? Right? We'll plot them both, although I don't think we'll get there uh, uh, quite today. Um, Okay, so, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to have just enough time to get into this. So the first thing is uh, interaction, when you compare the interaction model to the main effect model, often the, ch the, the parameter estimates change in wild and un inexplicable ways. So that's what I want to show you here. Um, this is another reason not to try to interpret these things. Uh, I, receive, I have routinely received panic emails from colleagues about this. Like, did I fit it wrong? It's like, no, you're just reading tables. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> So it's not their fault, again, victims of curriculum. It's no scientist's fault, right? Uh, so let's do the model comparison first at the top here, just to show you that the interaction model is a lot better. Um, uh, this is a case where we're getting a pretty wide separation. Look at the WAC graph. Here's the distribution of the standard error. What, this is the difference. Standard error, one in both sides. This is pretty good evidence the interaction model is going to make better predictions. It's picking up something. And of course it is. You know the biology here. If there's no light, water doesn't matter. Right? A tulip grown in the dark it doesn't matter how much water you give it. And a, and a tulip without water doesn't matter how much light you give it, right? I mean, you know this. So the interaction is real. And, and uh, WIC picks that up. Um, now let's look at uh, the coefficient table and just see how hard it is uh, to interpret what's going on. Um, uh, well, first, let me, let me show you the, the non-interaction model. These we can interpret. You guys have gotten good at these, right? Uh, all, they're all the box data, right? You're really good at this. Uh, so here's the intercept, and the value of that is uninterpretable because it could be anywhere, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't think about it much. Um, and here's the coefficient for water. It's positive, so water helps. Right? As water increases, the mean blooms go up. And that's correct. That's absolutely true. Um, the effect of shade is negative. Uh, as you increase shade, blooms get smaller. Uh, and that makes sense as well. And then you've got your residual variance. Uh, makes sense. And that's, this model is not lying to you. It's picking up the major trends, but it's ignoring the interaction. Now we look at the interaction model, which makes substantially better predictions. Um, both in sample and out of sample. And, okay, now the intercept has changed direction, but so what? We never really, I've tried to train you to ignore it, right? Unless you center 
uh, your predictors, you can't really interpret it at all. Um, uh, but notice that it's changed completely. The sign is completely different. It's swung around a lot. A huge change. Uh, you might worry about that a little bit. Uh, there's been a doubling of the effect of water. Like, what? Really? Is water twice as important as the other model thought it was? No. Uh, uh, just pre uh, <laughs> prelude here. No, that is not what has happened. Um, the effect of shade has flipped around. Now shade helps. Is that right? No, <laughs> it is not. Uh, and now we've got the interaction uh, coefficient, and it's negative. And what does that mean? Right? Uh, how does that let us understand the combination of these two uh, predictors on it? Um, what's happening here uh, uh, is that the meaning of, of these parameters, like the main effects, BW and BS, is not the same in these two models. They have the same label, but they have different meanings. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with that hanging in the air. Uh, and, and when you come back on Thursday, I will reveal how the meaning has changed uh, so that you don't stumble into the hazards of my senior colleagues. All right. Thank you, guys. I'll see you on Thursday.